Only on nine. And this is an incredible story. It starts with some tense moments for a young pregnant mother on her way to the hospital as she ends up giving birth inside her car. It all turned into a complicated situation with a roller coaster ride of emotions. News 9's Michael Konoposik joins us with this story. Michael? Well, Kelly and Amanda, Keaton Mason and her fiancé were just 15 minutes away from home when their baby decided it was time. What happened next is being called a miracle, a gift from God. It was crazy. It made me cry. It was just before 10 Thursday evening. People at this truck stop were in for a surprise. The lady was screaming, my baby, my baby's blue, she's not breathing. A baby girl born in the passenger seat of this Honda had the umbilical cord wrapped around her neck. Mom and dad were on the phone with 911, panicking, not knowing what to do. In that moment, the baby was not breathing, but help was just feet away. Her angel was there. He was our angel that night, that's for sure. A man named Gary Wilson was in the right place at the right time. He did everything uh, perfectly right. Gary saved the infant's life by freeing her neck, tying the umbilical cord, and rubbing her back. Looked over and this guy's holding a sign saying Memphis. The hero, a homeless man hitchhiking east. I would describe him as kind of like looking at Jesus. He had the long hair, the long beard. Very nice gentleman. He kept me pretty calm, actually. He kept telling me, you know, everything's okay, she's okay, she's breathing. On one of the 911 calls... Six inches from the baby, do not cut it. ...is a polite, calm voice. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, I'll do that. Now, Six okay. inches away from the baby. The voice of Gary Wilson, who by the next morning was already long gone. Well, Tatum Brown was born four pounds, 11 ounces, and four weeks early, but doctors say she is doing just fine. After Gary's good deed, employees at the truck stop offered him a hot meal and a place to sleep. Michael Kanapasik, News 9. All right, Gary, wherever you are, good work. The home in Michael. We were made to be courageous. We were made to lead the way. We could be the generation. It finally breaks the chains We were made to be courageous We were made to be courageous We were warriors on the front lines Standing unafraid But now we're watchers on the sidelines While our families slip away I remember when Tony Perkins first felt the heart of God to call pastors to have a corporate time of prayer for the nation every year. The call to fall was born out of a leader's heart for the nation and the understanding that pastors and their churches can be positive gatekeepers for America. I believe that prayer is essential and fundamental for our success in being involved in whatever happens in government and politics. And the reason why is because prayer, if you look at the believers in the New Testament, prayer was to, is to enable them to receive power and anointing so they could be effective 
We cannot be effective without God. We need the Lord uh, to, to empower us, to give us boldness, to give us confidence, to break the fear out of, out of our lives so we can go forth and be the, the world changers. I believe prayer is our only hope. I believe that praying for God to forgive us and to give us another chance as a nation is the place where we are right now. And if we don't get that, we, we don't have any place to go. And the last several years, we have partnered with the Family Research Council uh, and taken part in the Call to Fall. In fact, last year, after the Call to Fall event, I had people come up to me saying, can we do this every Sunday? Uh, they were so excited about being able to come and pray for America. So we, we actually have our worship team that's there. They will play. Someone will grab the microphone and pray. They'll break out into a song, somebody else will pray, they'll lead us in another course of worship. So it's this atmosphere, not only of prayer and intercession, but of worship to God. And then it just sets the stage for, for Sunday's worship time. The Sunday before... Voluntarily, I will risk my freedom over there. Voluntarily, I will kneel down and I will let myself get, well, they don't use handcuffs, they use zip ties, but voluntarily, we will go. However, 
The time is coming when it will not be voluntary. The time is coming when everybody will be called to obedience. It will be biblical obedience to say no more, to say I will not pay for these things that violate my faith. The time will come when the whole church will be called to stand. And yesterday we were praying, we sang Amazing Grace, and I am, I am personally embarrassed to say that I started crying um, because, you know, I'm the activist and I, I have to be the strong one. I lead a team of young people and um, it was really embarrassing for someone like with their camera up in my face and I was like, get away from me. And he said, why are you crying? And the truth is my heart breaks. My heart breaks that there are only 200 people here, maybe 300. And I told him my heart breaks. I am not here to send a message to President Obama. I am here to send a message to the church because we are the ones who are being persecuted and we are the ones that are allowing that to happen. What does it say when there are only 20 people who are willing to kneel down and pray in front of the White House? Our nation has historically been a place of asylum for people that have been fleeing religious persecution. We know that in Mexico, in the 1920s, an army rose up against the government and their faith became outlawed. But we also know that there are stories of people who fled Mexico so they could continue practicing their faith. There's a story of Mother Luisita, um, I am very fond of because she fled to Los Angeles, which is near my home. The Carmelite Sisters of the Most Sacred Heart of Jesus, they fled, their whole convent fled, and they came to the United States and settled in Los Angeles. And they had to hide their religious garb. They had to flee in disguise. And when they came to the United States, they knelt down and they prayed in Thanksgiving because they could wear their habits in public. We cannot let this country get to the point that we have to hide the fact that we are Christians. There are stories of other people who came to the United States. The pilgrims sought asylum here. Catholics sought asylum here in Maryland. Jews sought asylum here from Germany. People sought asylum here are still seeking, seeking asylum here from Cuba. Orthodox Christians sought asylum here from Russia. And today, people are seeking asylum to practice Christianity in the United States because they cannot practice Christianity in China and Vietnam. Yes. I wonder, where is that country today? If we are the country that people historically run to for freedom and our freedoms are being revoked, where is our hope? My heart breaks for the church. My heart breaks for those who are not courageous enough to stand up. But we here, we are courageous enough. And it is our job. Once we stand here, it cannot end. It is our job to go forth tomorrow and the day after and the day after and go back to your home communities, your home parishes, your home churches and tell them we can take no more. Amen. We will not comply. Amen. <laughs> We know that you hear your people's prayer. And we, the people of the United States of America, are tired. Yes, we're tired and can no longer sit idly by in the stagnant pews of do nothing, bound by the heavy chains of tolerance. We're tired, Lord, and we can no longer allow ourselves to be lulled to sleep by the melodic symphony of self delusion. We're tired, Lord, we, the people of the United States, we're tired. And we refuse to walk quietly down the corridor of judicial, political, and mainstream media. You arrest me next, so I turn off the camera, huh? The foundations of our society to be abducted and unjustly incarcerated behind the John Andrews Bell being arrested. Which is a caricature of freedom and equality. And it's my turn.
In the United States Capitol Rotunda, there's a beautiful painting of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Hello, I'm Tony Perkins here in Washington, D.C. If you're considering whether or not to register and to vote in this fall's election, I want to share something with you. Fifty-six men signed this document, the Declaration of Independence, which established our freedom and led to you and I having the right to vote. Now, some of you may be saying you're just simply too busy to vote, or you're frustrated with politicians, or you don't like what's going on in your state's government. Well, and here in Washington, the Republican president and the Democratic Congress have the lowest approval ratings in recent history. So some of you may be tempted to show your disdain by not voting. Well, keep this in mind. Of the 56 men who decided to take a stand for faith, family, and freedom with their signature on this Declaration of Independence, all 56 were the subjects of manhunts by the British. Five were captured, imprisoned, and treated harshly. Several lost wives, children, or entire families. One lost his son in combat. Another had two sons captured. Two wives were brutalized by the British. Twelve signers had their homes seized, some of which were destroyed. Nine signers died during the war. Seventeen lost everything they owned. Now, your kids probably won't learn this in the public schools, so you'll have to tell them about the sacrifices made by these 56 men, their wives, and their children. But as you can see, freedom is not free. These men and their families paid a dear price so that you and I would have the right to vote. So please consider honoring their sacrifice. Do your civic duty. Register and then vote your values in November.
تو و رام بدی دیلویز کوبه نخبدی morning I had another talk with the German Chancellor Herr Hitler and here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine we regard the agreement signed last night as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again When Hitler rose to power, no one believed that he would actually do the things that he said. You know, our history teaches us something very simple. When an enemy says he's going to annihilate you, believe him. Iran today poses a danger that threatens to engulf the entire world in chaos. A nuclear-armed Iran is a grave danger to the peace and security of the entire world. Diplomacy has failed. Will sanctions work? If diplomacy doesn't work, the clock could run out. We've wasted years on failed diplomacy. and There's no chance that Iran will be talked out of its nuclear weapons program. Iran is believed to be expanding right now its uranium enrichment activity deep inside of a mountain bunker. Iran has tripled the pace of production of 20% grade uranium. They're transferring their facilities underground to be immune. Time is running out. They're racing towards acquiring a nuclear weapon. None of us can afford to wait much longer. For the sake of our prosperity, for the sake of our security, for the sake of our children, Iran must stop be Iran. Stop now. Last time, the world was silent. This time, our voices will be heard. In a world 
where one man cannot lose. The fate of the world rests in one top secret mission. This is my last flight, basically. Yeah, I understand. After my election, I have more flexibility. I understand. I transmit this information to Vladimir and Mr. Your mission is simple, Mr. Obama. Win one last election to gain unchecked flexibility, weaken our defenses, and fundamentally transform the world. Dimitri will transmit the information. I transmit this information to Vladimir and Medvedev. Starring Barack Obama as President Flexible, Dmitry Medvedev as Dr. Transmitkov, and Vladimir Putin as himself. After my election, I have more flexibility. After my election, I have more flexibility. Operation Hot Mike. If we don't pass the torch to the next generation, everything that we've fought for will pass away. If we don't have people who believe the principles of freedom, we won't be a free nation. The only way you can be a free nation is if you have a citizenry that's educated well enough to understand what it takes to preserve freedom. It is so important that the next generation of young people be ready and prepared to fight for freedom. Good future leadership happens intentionally. And that's what Gen J is all about, to make sure that people understand the principles of freedom and will be willing to lead the country toward freedom in the years ahead. This idea of freedom is the most important thing that we have, and it's worth fighting for. I don't want to be someone who grows old watching the sunset of America and telling my son stories about it, what it used to be. Our country's future is at stake. If Christians cease to be involved, we'll lose the foundation that made America great. America is great because America is good. We need some young people who will stand up, who will believe in freedom, and really understand the God-given foundation this nation is built upon. Stand up for what is right. Don't give up. Every single person has a sphere of influence, and God has put you into that place to make a difference. Love has to follow. Practical action of love has to follow. 실천되는 사랑이 이제 보여야 됩니다. 이 가슴에 그렇죠. 머리에서 이해하고 가슴에서 뜨거워지는 게 실천이 돼야 되죠. Three H's, it's very important. When you understand the truth of God's word, it always has to register up your head. It has to go from head, three H, the head to the heart to the hand. Head to the heart to the hand. Look what the Bible says. What good is it? James 2.14 says, What good is it, my brother, if a man claims to have faith but has no needs? 내 형제들아 만일 사람이 믿음이 있노라 하고 행함이 없으면 무슨 이익이 있으리요? 이게 뭐야 이게? 오늘날로 말하면 이게 뭐야? 하나님이 그러실 거예요. 이게 뭐야 이게? 아니 이게 뭐야 형제들아 사람 사랑이 사람이 믿음이 있노라 하고 사랑이 있노라 하고 행함이 없으면 이게 뭐야 이게? 이게 뭡니까? 그거 이게 뭡니까? What is this? If, a, if you claim to have Faith and love, and there's no deeds. What is that? What is that? I want to show you a church that's nearby, Buena Park Baptist Church, that for 23 years has consistently ministered to the weak, the poor, and the homeless. This particular church is where our church goes every month to serve, to to people who live there in the shelter provided by the church to cut their hair, to love them, to cook, make food for them. We go there every month, our church does. But it's a beautiful story of how one church decided, okay, what we understand up here, what is burning in my heart here, we're going to put it into action. Buena Park Baptist Church, we go to the medal. We go to the United States Senate team. We go to the shelter in the shelter. We go to the shelter in the shelter. 음식을 해드리고 이 교회가 어, 여기서 얼마 안 돼요 이 교회가 참그 지난 23년 동안 우리 주위에 있는 교회인데 얼마나 그 예수님의 사랑을 가지고 액션, 디드를 하고 있는가 잠시 좀 보시길 바라요 Look at this church and be inspired 
On Wednesday, February 4th, at 2.30 in the afternoon, we visited the First Southern Baptist Church of Buena Park. This church runs a homeless shelter. This homeless shelter is one of six total homeless shelters in the entire Orange County area, and it is one that Sarang Community Church has been helping for the last six years. The senior pastor of the church, Pastor Wiley S. Drake, is also the caretaker of the shelter. I came here in 1987 as pastor of this church. That was a little over 20 years ago. And after I had been here about three years, brought to my attention that we needed to help the poor and the homeless in the community. And for the first three years, we did very little. And then in 1990, we started doing clothes and food and, and just started small and then grew it to where it's at today. Pastor Drake showed us around the church facility. The first thing they do for a homeless person is to set up a phone line and a mailbox. Well, if they don't have a place to sleep and they don't have a phone number and they don't have a place to take a shower, they can't get a job. Let's say a guy by the name of Smith, you know, he comes, his mail will be in the S. Now he has a mailing address. Now he can fill out an application for employment if he has a mailing address. He also has a telephone number here. Now he has a telephone number. And that's the first way we help them. The homeless population in general in Orange County, about 30,000 homeless. The sweet aroma of a home-cooked meal catches our attention. This is the kitchen area. Of course, our refrigerators. And this is Brenda. Hi, how are you? She's, she's our cook. She's getting ready for tonight's meal. Volunteers are preparing meals for the homeless. Most of the volunteers are homeless themselves. We were living homeless in our car, and we came here for a place to stay, and Pastor opened his doors to us. The pantry is filled with food donated by different groups, organizations, and individuals. All of these cookies and bread are donated to us by grocery stores and bakeries and, and all kinds of places. Pastor Drake emphasizes the crucial necessity of the spiritual need as well as the physical need of a person just shelter somebody uh, does not have the same effect as if you have shelter plus counseling. So uh, that's definitely a need, I think, uh, where a church can be involved in. Across from the kitchen is the dormitory. The dormitory can hold about 55 people. So this is the ladies' side and the other side is the men's side. And this, we have about 55 beds in here. Single beds, double beds, about 55 altogether. It's not what one can normally call a home, but it is a warm shelter for those in need. With round-the-clock security, it is very safe, and strict rules are enforced. Everybody here, we normally would give 30 days opportunity to find them a job. We don't care if they have other religions that they worship or other things that they worship. When they're here on our time, they have to give our God his time arise from a Catholic food bank. Thank you very much for bringing the food. We appreciate it. As I was saying, it's a perfect example. We're Baptist. Saran Church is a Presbyterian church, and Second Harvest is Roman Catholic background. So here's an example of three denominations coming together. working together, coming together. Helping those in need crosses all denominational lines and barriers. There's maybe 10,000 pounds right here. I mean, it's quite a bit. So you do thousands of pounds thousands. typically every day. 170 people every day. Consistent, continual outside help is absolute. A man who heartily greets Pastor Drake is none other than Tony Samiago, who claims to have fought in the Korean War in yes. 1950. Yes, I was in Korea in 1950. Wow. Yeah, I went to service in 1948. I was 18 years old. Uh, I was a jump master. And then I went up from there, I went to Korea and with my men. And uh, I was fortunate to come back alive, but it took me a lot of years to get over it. Uh, the, the death of my men. When we looked at Tony, who risked his life for Korea, we realized that this is a way to repay for what he and others have done for us. <laughs> it's just past 5 o'clock, but there is already a long line of people waiting to get food. Mr. David Gonzalez has been helping the homeless in this shelter. I enjoy this a lot. 
And this is just an all-out good place to be. Like, the people here are kind. I love everybody here, and they're courteous, and just beautiful, beautiful people, and, 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 and the services are great. From 7 o'clock in the morning to 5 in the evening, people constantly serve out food for all seven days of the week. Love and care seem to be the only way for broken souls to be lifted up. You can't truly affect the quality of life uh, just flying in, flying out. There's more of a consistency and a commitment that must be made. You know, till Jesus comes, we're, you know, we believe the Bible makes it very clear. Inasmuch as you've not done it under one of the least of these, my brethren, you've not done it under me. So we're doing this uh, for Jesus, we're doing it to Jesus, and we're doing it because the need is so great. Until we go to heaven, that's right, that's right. He is living out Christ's command to Christians to love our neighbors as ourselves. In these tough economic times, just as Christ Jesus has done in his earthly ministry, we wish to continue his ministry of love and hope for the broken and the lost. Can be Can a nation be back to you? Amen. Love has to follow. Practical action of love has to follow. Shine bright and it would be shining still But they all started turning on each other mm. You see the poets thought the dancers were shallow And the soldiers thought the poets were weak And the elders saw the young ones as foolish and the rich man never heard the poor man speak And one by one they ran away With their made-up minds to leave it all behind And the light began to fade In the city on the hill The city on the hill Each one thought that they knew better they were different by design Instead of standing strong together They let their differences divide And one by one they ran away With their made-up minds to leave it all behind And the light began to fade In the city on the hill The city on the hill Searching still But it was the rhythm of the dancers That gave the poets life It was the spirit of the poets That gave the soldiers strength to fight It was the fire of the young ones It was the wisdom of the old it was the story of the poor man that made it to be told. It is the rhythm of the dancers that gives the poet's life. It is the spirit of the poets that gives the soldier strength to fight. It is the fire of the young ones. It is the wisdom of the old. It is the story of the poor man that's needing to be told. One by one we'll be run away. With our made-up minds to leave it all behind As the light begins to fade in the city on the hill One by one we run away 
But with our made up minds to leave it all behind As the light begins to fade in the city on the hill The city on the hill Come home And the Father's calling still Come home To the city on the hill Come home. I am an American soldier. I'm a warrior and a member of a team. I serve the people of the United States and live the Army values. I will always place this first. I will never accept defeat. I will never accept defeat. I will never quit. I will never leave a fallen comrade. I am disciplined. I am disciplined. Physically and mentally tough. Trained and proficient in my warrior tasks and drills. I always maintain my arms, my equipment, and myself. I am an expert and I am a professional. I stand ready to deploy, engage, and destroy the, the enemies, enemies of the United States of America in close combat. I am a guardian of freedom and the American way of life. I am an American soldier. I am an American soldier. I am an American soldier. They're strong, and there's Army strong. See what it takes at GoArmy.com. No one will be able to be armed. We will take all weapons.
every service member has an obligation, not just, not just that they, that they can refuse a legal order or an unlawful order, they have an obligation to, they have to. And so they have to make a decision for themselves where that line is. Anyone can understand why these people, after six days, are still in this filthy, filthy, miserable convention center. Why are they still here? There's the freeway here. I tell you what I would have done, I would, what I would still do, I would say, let them walk out of here. Let them walk away from the filth. Let them walk away from the devastation. Let them walk away from the dead bodies in here. Them walk out of there because I'm standing right above that convention center. And what they've done is they've locked them in there. The government said, you, you go here and, and you'll get help. Or you go in that Superdome and you'll get help. And they didn't get help. They got locked in there and they watched people being killed around them. And they watched people starving and they watched elderly people not get any medicine. And now they know it's happening because we've been telling them repeatedly over and over every day. And you know what they're doing now? And I'm not blaming anyone. I'm telling you what's happening. They have set up a checkpoint at the bottom of this bridge. That, this is the bridge that takes you from New Orleans over into Gretna, from Orleans Parish into Jefferson's Parish. It's the only way out. It's the, it's the connection to the rest of the world. And they've set up a checkpoint, and anyone who walks out of that city now is turned around. You are not allowed to go to Gretna, Louisiana, from New Orleans, Louisiana. Over there, there's hope. Over there, there's electricity. Over there, there's food and water. But you cannot go from there right, to Chef, there. I think the government will not allow you to do it. It's a fact. I don't, I don't know, man. I don't. Let them walk out of here. Let them walk the hell out of here. Let them get on that interstate and walk out. Walk. We had Walmart deliver three trucks of water, trailer trucks of water. FEMA turned them back. They said we didn't need them. This was a week ago. Uh, FEMA. Uh, we had a hundred. We had a thousand gallons of diesel fuel on a Coast Guard vessel docked in my parish. The Coast Guard said, "Come get the fuel right away." When we got there with our trucks. They got a word. FEMA says, don't give you the fuel. Yesterday, yesterday, FEMA comes in and cuts all of our emergency communication lines. They cut them without notice. Our sheriff, Harry Lee, goes back in. He reconnects the line. He posts armed guards on our line and says, no one's getting... Before we issue our declaration of 10 orders that we will not obey, and what those are designed to do is to get the troops thinking ahead of time about where the line of the sand is in advance. And that's what we're hearing in feedback from people in National Guard units is that, that in Katrina, that's kind of what happened, is the police and the military there, the National Guardsmen, were, were caught off guard and really hadn't thought about it in advance. Walking up and down these streets, you don't, you don't want to think about the stuff that you're going to have to do. Somebody pops around the corner. Let me shoot in America. And what we're hearing is, is that it won't be the same way next time. There'll be more who will say, no, I'm not going to do that.
dedicate themselves to a sense of honor, to a life of courage, and a commitment to something greater than themselves. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before. Above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what Rejected and alone Like a rose Trampled on the ground You took the fall And you thought of me Above all Okay, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the Wiley Drake Show. My name is Wiley Drake, and this is the Wiley Drake Show, and I'm making some minor changes here, and I'll be right with you, hopefully in just a minute. Uh, we are live on Crusade Radio, and we do thank the Lord for the opportunity to be here with you today on Crusade Radio, and we do appreciate you being here with us. And uh, thank you so much for being a part of this show. We're going to talk to you about some uh, new things on the show. We do have a new feature. But before we go any further, let me just say welcome to the Wiley Drake Show. This show is under the auspices of the First Southern Baptist Church of Buena Park. Now, at that point, I want to give you a couple of websites. The first one is Buena Park the First Southern Baptist Church, and that website is First Southern Baptist Church of Buena Park dot com. Now I know the first, the first thing everybody's gonna say, golly, what a long website. Well, I just believe the website ought to be descriptive. I know everybody uses acronyms and abbreviations, but that's just not me. Uh, the name of our church is First Southern Baptist Church of Buena Park and that is the website, First Southern Baptist Church of Buena Park .com. Now, there is another organization and another website I want to give you. The other organization is an organization that I work with, and that is the American Independent Party of California, and that's AIPCA.org, uh, I believe, AIPCA.org, uh, and uh, we'll be careful uh, to make sure of that in just a moment, but uh, I, I want to make sure, uh, let's see, A I P C A. I want to make sure if that, hey, 
Yeah, I think she went down there and tore up something. Went down there and tore up a car, yeah. Yeah, sure did. And uh, all right, thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, like I said, it's always good to go on trips. I like trips, but I'm sure glad to be back, I'll guarantee you. I got this Aki stuff in the back. Okay, okay. All right, all right. We'll, you, we'll get together here. Well, let me go ahead and do my show. We'll get together here in a little bit after the show. And um, we do thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to try to see if I can pull this thing up and uh, see if we can get it. www.aipca.org. Let's see if that works. Yeah, there it is. Uh, the American Independent Folks, the party in California is AIPCA.org. AIPCA.org. And if you go to that website, you'll find it's a central committee chair that is the, the chairman of the California uh, AI, AIP is yours truly, Wiley Drake. And now, so you can go to the AIPCA.org. That's another website to check up the American Independent Party. Now, the other uh, website that I would like to give you is the website for the other organization that I am so uh, glad to be a part of now since the year 2000, and that is the Congressional Prayer Conference of Washington, D.C. The Congressional Prayer Conference of Washington, D.C. was initiated by a gentleman by the name of Rod McDougall and a, a senator by the name of Sam Brownback. And I joined them, and so we formed in 2000, January of 2000, we formed the Congressional Prayer Conference of Washington, D.C. Since that time, in 2010, actually 10 years later, in June of 2010, Rod McDougall uh, pleased Almighty God, and God was blessed because Rod went home to be with the Lord. And so uh, I am now the chairman of the Congressional Prayer Conference of Washington, D.C. And the website, again, is long, but it's Congressional Prayer Conference of Washington, D.C.com. And you're welcome to go to that website. You can also see my picture there. You can see our purpose and so forth and when we were founded. You will also see a picture of my co chairman. Uh, after Rod uh, went home to be with the Lord, I decided as the remaining leader to change the, the designation for our officers. We had president, and that was Rod McDougall, and vice president, Wiley Drake. Well, I decided that that was not the best way to do it, and so the Lord laid it on my heart to change it to be the chairman of the, com of the uh, Congressional Prayer Conference and to have then a co-chairman. Well, after some period of time and after going through several <clears throat> possible co-chair people, men and women, we didn't eliminate them. We didn't make them all Baptists. They were Pentecostals, Assembly of God, Catholic, everything. After going through several people to see who would be the best leader, God led us to and led him to us, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Clyde Rivers. Dr. Clyde Rivers uh, is the ambassador at large for the African country of Burundi. Now, he is an American citizen, lives in this country, works in this country, but is the ambassador at large for uh, our uh, friends there in Burundi because the president of Burundi is a very godly, very godly man, and we praise God for him and praise God that we can be working with him. Now, uh, I'm going to go out to the AIPCA.org is the website, the other website that I wanted to give you. And we do thank you for being a part of this Wiley Drake show today. Give us a call and let us know uh, how we can uh, best minister to you. Now, we're also going to talk to you about uh, something that is... Uh, somewhat new, relatively new, and that is a new feature of the Wiley Drake Show. A new feature of the Wiley Drake Show is indeed uh, a thing called uh, the Court of Public Opinion. The Court of Public Opinion. And I'm going to share with you in a little bit a little bit more about that. 
But before we do that, I want to tell you how you can get in touch with us. If you would like to call us, if you'd like to be a part of the show today, uh, I am back in the studio. It feels good to be back in my chair. Uh, uh, feels good to be back. I hope Jaime's doing some better. Uh, he was stung by a bee, and he's allergic to that. And looked like he, uh, it, it's looking a little better, but <laughs> it doesn't look like he's been in a street fight this time. <laughs> But anyway, pray for him, pray for his healing, uh, pray for clearness uh, from that. Now, uh, Brother Jaime puts the shows together that you see at 8 o'clock and at 4 o'clock. And this is sort of the uh, other new feature of the Wiley Drake show. And that is, Brother Jaime puts up videos, MP3s, audios, basically puts up what I call instruction and inspiration for the Wiley Drake show that will follow one hour later. Now that comes on at eight o'clock in the morning. Now these time I'm going to give you are all California times. So at eight o'clock, uh, that show is on with what Jaime puts up there. And if you would like to have your video, your information, your organization up on that instructional hour, there's a couple of requirements that we require of you. You must be uh, Judeo-Christian. You must be Judeo-Christian, and you must have a biblical worldview. Now, if you qualify on those, then you get in touch with Jaime, and Jaime will put what you have up. We have all kinds of things up there, everything from the Branson Cross uh, to the Promise Keepers uh, to um, Survivors.la to Acts 529, uh, all kinds of things are up there, all kinds of information, music, inspiration, and instructional, and that's on from 8 o'clock till 9 o'clock every morning, and then at 9 o'clock, I go live either here from the studio or in the last few days live from up in uh, Clovis, uh, California, there for the Southern Baptist Convention. We'll talk more about that later. But, uh, and then at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, Brother Jaime plays uh, patriotic music, uh, information and instruction uh, in organizations, Judeo-Christian organizations, and uh, puts up information on folks' books and so forth. And then at 5 o'clock, I go live, and that's what's going on right now. I just barely made it here. I had about five minutes to spare. I drove uh, this afternoon. We left at 1230, and I averaged 70 miles an hour for three hours. <laughs> I drove from Clovis down to here, and so at 1230, uh, I, uh, three hours later, I, I was close here but not all the way here. And at that first three hours of the trip, we indeed uh, averaged 70 miles per hour. That meant, obviously, I was driving a little faster than that. But uh, God blessed us. God gave us a good trip here. We got into L.A., of course, and the traffic backed up, and we had some uh, relatively serious problems. Now, uh, we finally got here, though, and we are here, and thank you. If you would like to call us, call us on the Crusade Radio number. It will answer automatically. And if you call and nobody says hello, that just means the machine has answered it for you. And uh, go right ahead and uh, hello. you won't be interrupting me. You'll just be coming in on the air with us. And, uh, go right ahead and, and so we thank you for that. Now, that's the first number, 559-592-5961. Now, the second number you can reach us on since I'm back in the studio, you can reach us, you can reach me on the 800 number. If you call the 800 number, this phone will ring and I will answer that phone. That's number two. Now, uh, that's line number two. That phone number is 1-800-839-3002. 800 839 3002 now, there is another number you can call if you would like to help keep alive uh, the ministry of Barbara Julianne Stevens Drake, that is my wife, Barbara, who I had as my wife here in this world 
uh, and the mother of my children and, and the grandmother of my grandchildren. And we had her, I had her, I was married to her for 48 years, one month and 14 days. And then on the 23rd day of October, which was yesterday, on the 23rd day of October, uh, I lost my dear wife. Not really. I didn't lose her. She went to heaven. <laughs> and uh, so I just praise the Lord. Uh, the Bible says God is pleased at the death of his saints. And my wife was a saint. Not because she was saintly, and she was, but she was a saint because she was a born-again child of God. And I thank God for that. <laughs> when she died, she went to heaven. And I'll see her again one day. I don't know what the circumstances will be up there. Someone has said, the one scripture says, there'll be no marrying and giving in marriage. Well, we won't have to be married. We'll already have been married. <laughs> we got married uh, September the 9th in the year 1962. And so you can count all of that up. She and I were married, lived together, raised our kids, ministered together for 48 years, one month and 14 days. Now, her ministry uh, was very instrumental in my ministry, and the Lord told me to keep her ministry alive, and there's a couple of ways we do that. One way is this telephone right here. This was Barbara's cell phone. It still is Barbara's cell phone, and, and it's still in her name, and it's still active. Now, <clears throat> if you would like to continue her ministry with this television program and with this radio program, you can call in on her phone number. Barbara's phone number was and is 714-865-8147. That's 714-865-8147. And you can call on that number, and I will answer that number for you to call in on the hotline to The Wiley Drake Show. Now, that's one way that we're keeping Barbara's ministry here on earth going on. Her prayer ministry is going on in heaven. Her fellowship ministry and all of that is going on in heaven. But we wanted to keep, I wanted to keep, her phone ministry to this show and her phone ministry to others alive. And so that phone number is still alive and can be used to call this show. That's the Barbara Drake Memorial Hotline. And you can call that number at 714-865-8147. Now, <clears throat> there's another way that we have uh, put together a little program that will help Barbara's ministry continue. Her ministry has not ceased. Her ministry has only changed locations. And we want her ministry to continue here <clears throat> at the First Southern Baptist Church. You see... Barbara Drake and I came here in 1987. That meant that Barbara Julianne Stevens Drake was indeed the First Lady of the First Southern Baptist Church for 23 years before she went to heaven. Now, Brother Will Ruffin, who is one of our associates and our brother in Christ, uh, said, I would like to put together a cross. I would like to build a cross for our First Lady, Barbara Drake. Now, when the First Lady of this church died in her body, now her soul is still alive and her spirit is still alive, but her body died due to age and illness. And when that body died, my children and I and the Lord decided that we would not do the typical southern wake or southern viewing of the body and all of those kind of things. On the day on Saturday the 23rd when Barbara went to heaven obviously she was gone. I could see her body laying there in the hospital and she was gone uh, but the body was still there. And so I called the kids and told them what had happened and they came over and really sort of said their goodbyes to the body that was laying there. <clears throat> and my oldest daughter, Kimberly, said, Dad, uh, I don't want us to do what they do in the South. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean? She said, I don't want us to 
take mom to the church and put her in a coffin and and have her there for viewing and have her there for people to come and pay their respects. Don't want to be disrespectful, but we want to say our goodbyes here tonight, and we will, to mom's body. Then we decided that the best way to do it would be to cremate her body. That is, take the body that she lived in and put it in a crematorium and reduce it to ashes. Now, at that point, we had a decision to make. Hello. Hi. At that point, we had a decision to make. Do we, uh, uh, do we take the ashes home and put them on the mantle, or do we take the ashes to the church? And so uh, between myself and my children and my friend, the local mortician, he suggested and we agreed that he would give us a memorial stone it is a stone about yay big by so big. He would put a plaque on the front with Barbara's picture and Barbara's birth and death date. And inside this monument rock, her ashes would be placed, and her ashes are there even as we speak. And so we interned Barbara's body there at our little memorial garden. Now, when her spirit left her body and her soul left her body, they went to heaven. But we had the body, and we decided to do that with the body. And so her body, the ashes from her body, are still here under the flagpole and in that rock at our little memorial garden between the flagpole of Israel and America and the Ten Commandments. She is in between those. She loved Israel dearly. She loved America dearly. And she loved this church. And she loved the Ten Commandments dearly. Now, that's where she's at. She has been interned there for a little over two years. On the 23rd day of this month, she had been interned there for two years. Many times <clears throat> during the last two years, I've gone out looked at her picture, and said a prayer for me, not for her. She don't need my prayer. She's in heaven. But I went there, and as I would often say, babe, I love you. And so I do that quite often, still, there at her memorial. And uh, <clears throat> I'm a little emotional. I apologize for that. But uh, we continue the work that God began here with us uh, as husband and wife. Now, I want to share a little bit about what has happened in the last week where I was. I drove from here up to Clovis, and I almost got there. I got within just a few blocks of the church there in Clovis uh, for our annual, our actually our 72nd. Now, I've not been there that long, but uh, the 72nd annual uh, convention of the California Baptist Convention was held in Clovis, California. And on Monday, I drove up there to Clovis, and just before I got to Clovis, uh, it had been raining, the first rain they had had in five months, and the traffic stopped dead in front of me. I put the brakes on, but to no avail. The rental car that I was driving crashed into the car in front of me, uh, really messing up the front end, exercising the uh, crash bag, and that uh, bag came open, prevented me from hitting the steering wheel, prevented me from hitting the windshield, and prevented the windshield from breaking in on me. And so God sent his angel uh, with an airbag <laughs> that was installed in the car and protected me. And I didn't get a bruise. I didn't get a scratch, no whiplash, nothing. And so God's angels and an airbag uh, from Enterprise Car Rental uh, saved, literally saved my life, saved me from being uh, uh, injured probably pretty severely. Uh, but that brings with it, of course, the inconvenience of having to get another car, and I do have another car. They've done that. They've worked that out for me. So it's been a great trip. I want you to know that we had a great convention there at uh, a church. We, here's a church we were at. It's called Clovis Hills 
Community Church. It's a Baptist church, a Southern Baptist church, a large church. They run about twelve to 1,400 on Sunday. And, of course, they have a big uh, area. <clears throat> we had uh, all of our messengers from the California Southern Baptist Convention. We had them at that convention, and we met. We approved a $10.8 million budget for the next year, for this upcoming year. Our year actually begins in October. October, November, December is the first quarter in the church year. And so we were still running, still working on last year's budget uh, for our finances, for our denomination in the state of California. But starting October 1st, uh, we will be working on the new budget, $10.8 million, that we as Baptists will gather together Sunday by Sunday and month by month here in the year of our Lord and Savior, 2012 that 2012-2013. So we had our uh, meeting there. Uh, I won't go into all the details. Uh, it was online. You can go to California Southern Baptist Convention and find uh, uh, video. It was streamed. I streamed some. You can find some on our TV show and so forth. But um, it was very, very exciting. There was another group that met, the African-American organization of California Southern Baptist met and had their meeting and elected their president. We also not only approved a budget, but we elected a new president and a new vice president and some other officers. And again, if you want to find out about those, you'll hear more about those in the days ahead. But we uh, had a great time. Uh, one of our great entities of the Southern Baptist Convention is right over here in Riverside, uh, California Baptist University. They brought in about a hundred uh, beautiful young men and women who sing in the CBU choir and orchestra. They did a great job. They're very professional. They're very godly. They're very beautiful in all aspects. Beautiful young men, young women, beautiful music, and beautiful, beautiful, sweet, sweet, uh, Holy Ghost-filled young people serving the Lord. And that's at California Baptist University there in Riverside. And Dr. Ellis was there, the president and so forth. Now, I say all of that to say we had a great convention Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Our disaster team uh, was there. They set up the tent that we use for first respondents for earthquakes, fires, floods, Go to the website and check out the Southern Baptist Disaster Team, and you'll see it. And on uh, a Tuesday night, last night, uh, the disaster team fed the Baptists. We had tri-tip and barbecue beans and um, uh, apple cobbler, and they do a great job. And that's the kind of food they feed in the disaster tent when that disaster tent is placed up at a literal disaster. Well, this was a practice run. And Don Hargis, who is head of California Disaster Relief, was there, and many other folks were there. And, of course, our, our boss in California, of course, is Jesus. But under Jesus, we have a man by the name of Fermin Whitaker. Fermin Whitaker uh, was there and uh, continues to serve as our executive director. And uh, we had a lot of other good reports and good meetings and a lot of fun things, and a lot of spiritual things. We heard some great, great testimonies about what God is doing through Southern Baptists all around California. And uh, also we heard a report from the uh, National Southern Baptist Convention, that is the Southern Baptist Convention of the United States. Now, we want you to know, folks, that uh, we all do cooperate very closely with the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, we are a large organization. We'll talk more about that later. But one of the things that I want to share with you is, is that uh, one of the things that we do here, many of you know, we uh, reach out and we go to bat for folks that end up being taken undue advantage of uh, by the cities. Uh, about six years ago, the city of Long Beach 
decided that it would declare eminent domain on a church, a Filipino church in Long Beach. Well, we went to that church and found out that they did not want to sell. They did not want to give up their building because they were ministering to people and winning folks to Jesus through the Filipino tradition of music and fellowship. And the whole area began to clean up began to do away with graffiti and began to come to know Jesus as Lord. And so the church was very, very successful there in Long Beach. But the city decided they wanted to build a hotel and make a lot of money. Well, I'm not against cities building hotels, not against cities making money. But if they're going to declare eminent domain on a church, they tried to buy the church and the church said it wasn't for sale. And then they tried to force them out through eminent domain. And we went to bat for them. I went over and did live broadcast. We took the court of public opinion to Long Beach. We didn't wait for them to come to us. We took the court of public opinion to them. We broadcast live around the world from their meetings, from their committee meetings. We had an attorney there that helped at that time. His name is Kennedy. Uh, Mr. William C. Kennedy, and I want to talk to you more about him in a few moments. But we worked with Mr. Kennedy. We went before the city of Buena Park, and we said, we will do two things. The attorney said, we will file a RELUPA lawsuit. Now, RELUPA is a law that prevents cities from just doing eminent domain for any reason they want to, for financial gain. And so we said, we will rely legally, and that's where we had the attorney involved, and I said, and as a pastor, as a broadcaster, we're going to put the city of Long Beach on the map. We're going to de designate, and we did that night at the city council meeting on the Wiley Drake Show, we designated Long Beach as the most unfriendly toward churches city in America. And so all of America rose up and sent letters and made phone calls, and we brought that case to the court of public opinion. Now, the, the attorney, William Kennedy, helped out. We did our job. The court of public opinion did its job, and finally the city doubled and tripled the offer on the church, and the pastor and the people of that Filipino church said, no, we're not, we don't want to sell our church. And so finally, the city gave in to the pressure of the court of public opinion and to the threat of a lawsuit, and they gave in and said, okay, we will not declare eminent domain, and that church is still there till this day, meeting the needs of the community blessing the Lord, fellowshipping and worshiping. And so the attorney and the court of public opinion went to work. Now, I was very pleased with that. We put out several emails later that this was a victory for Jesus and the good guys, and it was. And even the city said, well, okay, we, we won't declare eminent domain. And the attorney, being a good attorney that he was, that was there, said, uh, that's not good enough because the attorney explained to us they could say today we're going to stop eminent domain and come right back tomorrow and redo it when we go away or the court of public opinion subsides. And so he said, we want something, we want a document, we want a, 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 in writing something that says we will not and cannot declare eminent domain against that church. And so the legal people got that done, and we, of course, went to the Court of Public Appeal and praised the Lord for those attorneys and praised the Lord for a victory for Jesus and the good guys and the church in Long Beach, the pastor and the people. Now, at that point, uh, I lost contact uh, with Mr. William Kennedy. And um, I thought I had kept his card, but I had not. And here... Last week, uh, as we began to initiate again the court of public opinion for the church in Harlem 
and got the police department involved there and demanded that they uh, bring a hate crime. And the court of public opinion ruled again, and that chief of police, that's not his exact title, but whoever was in charge of the police precinct there by Outlaw Church and the hate crime, finally reneged and said, okay, no more calls. The court of public opinion has ruled, and we will indeed file a hate crime case. You see, they had said, we're not going to file a hate crime. It's not a hate crime. It's only graffiti. Well, it wasn't graffiti. It was a hate crime. They broke into the building. Uh, they destroyed property, and they put big anti-Christ, anti-God murals all over the building, and it was a hate crime. Had that been have done on any other organization, if it would have been done at a gay and lesbian front store, or if it would have been done on a mosque, it would have all been ruled a hate crime. But the police were saying, no, we're not going to do it. Well, another victory for Jesus and the good guys. The court of public opinion ruled. We put out phone numbers. We put out names and the phone number and the name of the gentleman who uh, was saying, no, I'm not going to do it, finally came back and said, okay, okay, I'll do it. We'll do it. Uh, we want to do it. We will do it. And so they have indeed done it. So another victory for Jesus and the good guys and another verdict of success in the court of public opinion. Now, if you have a case, I don't care what it's about, if you believe your religious and your constitutional rights are being denied, we're taking, for example, the HHS mandate to the court of public opinion. This last Weekend, we took it to the Court of Public Opinion here locally in Pasadena and in Anaheim, and some 200 other cities around our nation took the Court of Public Opinion uh, on this Stand Up for Religious Freedom. And we all said, previously on Acts 5, 29, 22 of us stood and said, we'll obey God rather than man. We went to jail for it. 32 others went to jail, and then 15 went to jail. A total of over 60 people went to jail, all to gain entrance and evidence into the court of public opinion. Now, at that time, after that was all over, and after we had been working with several families who have had their children taken away unrighteously and without a warrant and not given back, we decided to continue to work with families and help them. And it came on my mind last week that the attorney that helped us in Long Beach, Mr. William Kennedy, I could not remember his name at that point, and so I asked several of our prayer warriors to please pray that God would cause our paths to cross again, that God would do one of two things. <clears throat> either help me find the business card that he gave me or have our paths cross. That was my prayer, and many of you prayed with me. Well, I dug through all of my mess, all of my junk, all of my drawers, all of my briefcases, and I could not find the business card. So I said, Lord, I ask you to forgive me for being so sloppy and losing the card, and I ask God to forgive me. And he forgave me, and I said, now, Lord, uh, you have to work this out somehow. Either help me find the card or help me cross paths. Well, while I was in Clovis, 250 miles from here, I was at the church, and I was doing my live broadcast, and I just finished my broadcast, and a pastor walked up that I knew, and we shook hands and said hello, and he turned and said, Wiley, I want you to meet my friend. And I saw this man, and immediately I knew who his friend was. I could not remember his name, but he handed me his business card, and he said, my name is William C. Kennedy, attorney at law. And I said, I know you're an attorney. I remember you from Long Beach. He said, oh, yes. And then he went on to say, 
that he came to that case not really understanding from a legal perspective. And he said, I had to admit that, that this preacher, Wiley Drake, knew more about the law called RELUPA than I did. And I had to understand that I didn't know, I had not done my homework, and that this preacher had. And so he said, that night, I was embarrassed. I went home, and I began to do my homework, and I found out about RELUPA, and that's Religious Land Use law that prevents eminent domain on a church and he said since then I've worked many other cases that was about six years ago and at that time uh, he and I had lost contact with each other and I had been praying that God would lead an attorney not just any attorney but that attorney here to help us so uh, later I'm going to give this to Jaime and he'll put it up on our webpage But right now, if you need an attorney, uh, I want to give you his website. I want to give you his name, his phone number, and his email. Now, the website is quite interesting. The website is www.lawyerswhofight.com. L-A-W. Y-E-R-S, who fight, lawyers who fight dot com. That's his webpage. And ladies and gentlemen, if you've heard me say it once, you've heard me say it probably a hundred times here on the Wiley Drake Show and in the court of public opinion. You have heard me say we need lawyers who are willing to fight. We need lawyers that are willing to fight. So this webpage is lawyerswhofight.com. The gentleman's name is William. C in the middle for Christ. (laughs) Don't know what his middle name is, but it's William C. And his last name is Kennedy. K-E-N-N-E-D-Y spelt in the traditional fashion, K-E-N-N-E-D-Y. His name is William C. William C. Kennedy, attorney at law. I gave you his webpage. Now I'm going to give you his address, his phone number, and his email. And if you need a lawyer who will fight, this man is a fighter. He's an old man like me, but I'll tell you what, I'm glad he's my friend. I would hate to meet him in the alley if he wasn't my friend. I'd end up looking like Jaime with a fat eye. (laughs) Not from a beach thing. But William C. Kennedy is a fighter, but he wants to do it legally. His name is William C. Kennedy, attorney at law. His address... For that website that I gave you, the lawyers who will, the lawyers who fight.com, the street address is 2392 University Avenue. That's 2392 University Avenue. The city is Riverside, Riverside, California. The zip code is 92507 and his and his business card says how do you say this Jaime H A B L A M O S H A B L A M O S Hablamos Hablamos mm-hmm. on his card it says Hablamos Español That means he speaks Spanish, right? (laughs) Okay. So on his card it says, Hablamos Español, and his phone number is 951-784-8920. His fax number to send him paperwork if you need to is 
800-826-8930. Now there's one other address I'm going to give you, and that's his email address. His email address is W dot Kennedy W dot Kennedy at lawyers who fight dot com. So it's W dot Kennedy at lawyers who fight dot com. We will be displaying all of this information on our television show and I ask him for permission to do that. And, a matter of fact, I'm going to see if I can raise him on the phone right now and tell him how pleased I was uh, to reunite with him and see if we can get him on the phone. If we can get him on the phone, we'll talk to him. If not, we'll leave him a message. didn't get to leave a message, <laughs> but uh, at any rate, uh, they will, uh, we'll, we'll contact them. I'll call him. I'll send him an email. I already have sent him some. I'll send him some more emails. We'll send him an email, but um, if you have any questions, look on the screen, and if you're still listening on Crusade Radio, and I assume that you are, I'm going to walk through this one more time uh, so we can give it to our radio audience, because if you don't have, uh, if you're not watching us on TV, the attorney's name is William C. Kennedy, K-E-N-N-E-D-Y. His address, 2392 University Avenue, Riverside, California, 92507. His phone number is 951-784-8920. His fax number is 951-784-8920. 8930. The website for his organization is, of course, www.lawyerswhofight.com. Lawyers, that's plural. Lawyerswhofight.com. And his email is w.kennedy. w.kennedy at LawyersWhoFight.com. The name of the law firm is Kennedy and Jimenez. I don't know if Mr. Kennedy speaks Spanish or not, but I have a feeling that Attorney Jimenez, his partner, is probably the Hispanic side that is either the one that speaks the Spanish or indeed uh, has taught Mr. Kennedy. Good afternoon. God bless you. Are you on the phone with me? Hello, who's this? This is Dr. B. Shaw. This Mel? No, this is Pastor Wiley, but you're on the Wiley Drake Show. Can I help you? Yes, you were supposed to, I was supposed to be interviewed tonight on my book, Win. All right, let's do it right now. Brother Mel had to be out of the studio. That's why the phone answered automatically. I want you, first of all, you're live on Crusade Radio right now. You're also live on television right now. That is the audio portion of you. I'm the one that's on the television camera. And uh, where do you live? I live in Newport Beach. Okay, well, my office and my studio is in Buena Park, just up the street from Knott's Beer Farm. Oh, and, we're close by then. Yeah, and so I would like to do the interview right now. But sometime in the very near future, I would like for you to come into the studio and let's redo it where the people can not only hear you, but see you. 
And uh, so, with that in mind, let me ask you to do this. At this point, please give your name, the title of your book, where they can get the book, websites, and so forth, and uh, how we can get in touch with you. And then in the very near future, we'll have you here in the studio. Wonderful. Go right ahead and give us that. Okay, I'm Dr. Ken B. Shore, president of the World Bible Society. And the book that I want to tell you about is titled When, W-H-E-N. And it is When Will the Rapture Take Place? And in this book, I show events that have taken place, that are now taking place, and 13 more events that will take place yet before the rapture. And I show that these events are taking place very rapidly. The coming of the Lord is rushing upon us. And, you know, if we're going to work for the Lord, we've got to do it pretty quickly. It's a book of 300 pages, and I think it deals with more scripture and prophetic events than how Lindsay's late great planet Earth or even Tim LaHaye's Left Behind series. This book covers prophecy with charts and helps that I don't believe you find in any other book. And you can get this book for a $20 donation to the World Bible Society. And our phone number is 1-800-866-WORD. 1-800-866-WORD. 866-W-O-R-D. The $20 covers shipping and handling and is received as a ministry gift because a, a loyal supporter of the ministry has bought these books for the ministry, and when they're given, a person can receive the full amount of donation in that sense. So, if you want the book, you can go to World Bible Society website, worldbible.com. World Bible Society has a daily broadcast with an outreach over the radio all over the world. I have printed over 12, over 10 million Bibles in Russia, and the Department of Education has asked the World Bible Society to give out our beautiful full-color illustrated New Testaments to every school child in Russia. We have a ministry in Africa, the Rock of Africa Mission. And our office is very close to you. We're at uh, Warner and Red Hill. So I appreciate you letting me be interviewed for the book. The book is titled W-H-E-N. You can get it by calling any hour of the day, one 800 8 W-O-R-D for $20 on any credit card and that includes shipping and handling. Dr. B. Shore, uh, thank you so much for sharing with us. Uh, I want to share... Yeah, a, I appreciate the opportunity. You're very kind. Well, uh, I want to also share with you a very personal point in reference to you your book, and your ministry. And let me tell you why. 25 years ago, uh, I came here to Buena Park as the pastor of this church. We just celebrated the beginning of our 26th year. And of course, as most pastors, we try to tell stories about history and so forth. And one of the stories that received quite a bit of accolade around the world in reference to my history was my telling of the story, and I'm going to tell it short as I can, but I think you'll be interested in it. But here's what, uh, here's what happened. Uh, in 1965, Dr. J. Vernon McGee took me under his arm as a preacher boy oh, great. and recommended that I go to Biola University. 
And so I went out and I enrolled at Biola University in 1965 in La Mirada. And after I'd been in school for a few weeks, I was new to school and I was working and tired. Uh, Biola every day had a chapel service. And the chapel service was after my class. And the day I was very tired, I, I wanted to go home and go to bed. Uh, but uh, uh, I said, I, I'm going to leave. One of my buddies said, oh, no, don't, don't go. Don't go. Go to chapel. We're going to have a great chapel today. Dr. Kenneth F. B. Shore is going to be helping in chapel. And Brother Andrew is going to be there. And I had heard about Brother Andrew, had no idea who uh, F. Kenton B. Shore was. <laughs> But I did know who Brother Andrew was, and so I said, okay, I'll go to chapel. And so I first met you at Biola in chapel when you were sort of the MC, I would guess for lack of a better term, and uh, Brother Andrew was uh, uh, a lot younger than he is now, and so was I, uh, but we had a great chapel time, and I was inspired and encouraged ladies and gentlemen, not only by my mentor, Dr. J. Vernon McGee and Walter Knott here at Knott's Bear Farm, but also my new mentors in school, in my ministry, uh, that is uh, Dr. Uh, F. Kenton B. Shore, and uh, of course I heard him many, many times after that, read much of his materials, and, and also uh, indeed Brother Andrew. So, Brother... Uh, he is still alive. In fact, we had uh, a gentleman by the name of Jerry on our morning show uh, in reference to Open Doors, and I asked the same question, uh, and he's well up in his 80s, but he's doing well, still traveling, uh, uh, just serving the Lord like he always has, and uh, uh, God bless him for that and continue to pray for him and pray for all of us. We're not getting any younger. <laughs> Yes, sir. In fact, I in ordained, I was ordained by R. J. Lee. I'm aware of that. That's, I, a, that's my home church. Yes, absolutely. And and uh, also, uh, Doctor B. Shore, in 206, 207, I was the second vice president of the Southern Baptist Convention. Wonderful. So uh, I've been sort of up and down. I've been. Uh, but this church here in Buena Park is called First Southern Baptist Church of Buena Park. And uh, I've been here, like I said, for 25 years, just up the street from Knott's Bear Farm. That's wonderful. And I just got back from Clovis, just drove in, barely made it back here for my 5 o'clock show uh, from Clovis because we as Southern Baptists met in Clovis for our 77th. 72nd, excuse me, 72nd annual state California Southern Baptist Convention, and we approved a $10.8 million budget that we're going to raise over the next year to work in California in what we're calling a multi-ethne, that is multi-ethnic effort to win people to Jesus. And uh, Dr. B. Shore, uh, Later, uh, if you will give me a call, uh, I'd like to set it up so you can come in here to the studio and we can uh, reminisce a little but also have you uh, talk about your book. Now, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me very closely. We have Dr. F. Kenton B. Shore. His book is called When. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you know that I do not promote books on this program unless the people are Judeo-Christian and unless they have a biblical worldview. And that's why we're promoting his book. He qualifies all the way around. But let me tell you what the incentive is to you listening on Crusade Radio and watching on the Wiley Drake Show on television around the world. If you purchase this book, if you purchase this book, you can call my producer and tell him, Bob, I read the book by Dr. F. Kenton, be sure, and I want to come on the Wiley Drake Show, and my producer will book you to come on the program 
and give a book report uh, from you if you purchase the book. So go and get the book, and now I'm going to give you, ladies and gentlemen, my producer's name and number. His name is Bob Bosworth, B-O-S-W-O-R-T-H. His phone number is 714-699-8657. And you tell him that Pastor Drake said to book you on the show to do a book report on this book called When. And he'll be glad to do that. And Dr. B. Short, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm looking forward to touching base with you again. And uh, let me give you my uh, telephone number and email. And I would appreciate you phoning me and emailing me. And then we will set you up to come into the studio here in Buena Park. Oh, that would be wonderful. I really appreciate that. And I love your work and praise God for what you're doing and having uh, friendship and fellowship over the years with you that uh, we really haven't been aware of for a long, long time. That's right. That's right. And we, of course, are the church here in Buena Park that, uh, that has the homeless ministry, and we do a lot of work there. And uh, we work very closely with Open Doors and many other ministries around the world. And uh, so my phone number... My phone number is 714-865-8132. Yes, sir. Thank you. I love you and appreciate this. We we'll look forward to more contact. Looking forward to it. And my email, if you want to send me an email, is Wiley Wiley. That's W I L E Y W I L E Y. Wiley Wiley at ATT dot net. Okay. So it's Wiley Wiley at ATT. Dot net. That's ATT like the phone company. Wonderful. So send me an email with your number. I'll get together, and I do a show here every day at 9 o'clock, and we also do one at 5 o'clock Monday through Friday, and you and I will talk about it, and we'll figure out which would be the best day for you to come in. And I'd love to have you just come in and set in on the show, and let's talk about the book. And, of course, I'm hoping you'll bring me a copy of the book. Well, I will be glad to do that. I'll send it to you right away. Thank you very kindly, my brother. Hey, love you. Take care. Love you, and God bless you, and have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, ladies and gentlemen, F. Kenton B. Shore, one of the men that was my mentor for many, many years. Good night, Dr. B. Shore, and have a great evening. Okay, we're going to get that busy signal, but I'm going to just hang up on that because that's Crusade Radio, and we should be off the air by now anyway. So, uh, Brother uh, Millar can come on. But we are still live on Ustream, and we're over, and we're going to stop now and say, remember, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God.